Thank you, Kalinda Tra from the European Women's Lobby. My question would be <coughs> a bit like the, um, um, and trying to have more details. As Agnès asked about the, or mentioned the power of the lobbies, and uh, I don't know if you have seen, um, if it's not in the book that I didn't read yet, um, how the lobby influence and where, where, at what time, and what kind of uh, different lobbies, like the commercial lobbies, or what we call otherwise uh, stakeholders or social lobbies. Thank you. I have also one question. I don't remember if the graph was in, in the book or in another paper you sent to me. But there was a ranking, subjective ranking of the DG and another paper. But it was interesting because you ask to people from the commission what are the most important DG mm -hmm. and uh, DG budget was very important for the apparently internally uh, but uh, DG uh, employment was uh, among the, the five the weakest uh, and my question is do do you notice a, a different strategy when you are weak uh, DG or consider as a weak DG so for example if you have the lead but you are weak DG you have to develop a different strategy to, to uh, gather uh, support than when you are like Finn or Mark, and then you have kind you don't have to do too much effort to uh, to build consensus, or do you don't have enough cases to, to say uh, that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, thanks a lot for for the very interesting comments and for me presenting this book here is kind of a reality check so I'm happy that that you like the stories and that you do not disagree entirely although you you probably know a lot more about some of these processes than I do so that's good for us um, and thank you also for all the different questions I will try to I probably can't answer all of them um, but I will try to pick out some where I found that you connected um, some of the time. But before that, I would like to, to ask you a question on the weakness of DGs. Well, it's an unpublished paper I sent you. Why is it unpublished? Because it does have some problems. And the main problem being that we selected our cases intentionally, and we asked all our interviewees for an assessment of DG strengths, which are the strongest and which are the weakest ones. But given that we, there are a lot of DGs we did not interview at all so it, it gives quite a shaky picture I would say so I wouldn't insist on DG employment being so weak but actually your question it, it, it has certainly become weaker during the period we study that we can say um, so um, what we try to do in the book is not to say um, one DG is weak and the other one is strong per se, but depending on, on, on the processes, um, they can use different power resources and they can do so quite successfully even if they are assumed a weak DG in some cases. So, so that's probably the, more the point we want to make. Now. Um, there were a couple of questions on, on stakeholders and interest groups, and you said they come a bit short in some of the stories. Um, but I also brought you, let's see where it is. This is a bit more complex, that's why I didn't show it in the, in the, in the presentation. Um, but here you find um, across our 48 cases, that's the black one, and then separated for the three policy areas, social and market, research and innovation, and consumer. You found the frequency um, with which a factor mattered for, in this case, position formation. Yeah? So you do see that organized interests are the second most important factor to explain positions. If you just look at the frequency, it does not mean um, that they always matter through the same mechanisms or um, etc. But they are very important. Um, so, uh, and that comes out more strongly in the comparative chapter of the book than in the one you, you read. Um, but you also see that they are a bit more um, important in some. Um, policy fields like research and innovation they're more important than in social and market for example so that 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 is um, what we found out there um, 
let me see, so I had that one. So that's the power of the lobbies, to put it that way, is very important to explain positions. And it's also important when it comes to the resources that um, are important um, in internal interactions. And here you see that um, the organized interests are still among the more important factors, although other ones that are more based inside the Commission are more important. Um, for example, um, in this case, we find that the coordination structures are very important, or being lead, um, and that also the, the, the supranational competences that you have in treaty are very important. And when it comes to internal conflicts, arguing that you have a strong um, treaty-based or that um, on your treaty-based the thing can be decided by majority and you don't need unanimity, all these things matter internally and all. Um, and this, the fact that being lead department is so important brings me to a number of questions you raised on, on the coordination structures inside the Commission. And again, there's a separate chapter in the book um, that in detail traces um, what are the different instruments, how they have changed over time with the Secretary General um, introducing a lot of new coordinating instruments that did not exist in the founding days of the Commission. Um, and um, for example, like the strategic planning you mentioned, that's very important in this respect. But in a way, that's before our research questions start, because we do not look at the process how actually um, the lead is assigned. We look when the drafting really starts in, in, in inside the Commission. But of course, that's, that's a room of maneuver where some of the questions we ask um, are already answered. Um, and we also find that over time um, there are more coordination instruments. There's um, also instruments like the impact assessment, um, the more um, computerized inter-service consultation and these things. But that does not mean that this automatically leads to more balanced processes because these coordination structures can still be used strategically by actors. Uh, and for example, within the SG, um, you do have like shadow um, officers um, who can um, put a process to a halt and say, okay, well, I don't think it's a good idea at the moment, um, maybe wait until next year. So this kind of thing still happened. Um, and in our analysis, um, coordination has empowered the Secretary General over time. Um, and. Um, the policy DGs had more leeway in doing what they wanted like 20 years ago, for example. So um, the SecGen also intervenes more often when it comes to actually assigning um, lead departments a bit differently than one would think, and that's part of the story about the European Globalization Adjustment from What I learned is that um, there was a strong interest from DG Regio to have it um, on, in their portfolio, um, but for political reasons, and that was really a political decision um, by the Commission President. He wanted to um, show that um, there is social Europe. So he wanted to have the European Globalization Adjustment Fund as a DG employment instrument. And that's why it ended up in DG employment. Um, and then they had to carve out technical solutions how to find funding because um, the financial uh, the member states wouldn't agree to have a, a, a separate um, budget line for, for the European Globalization Adjustment Fund. So together with DD budget, they had to, to find a solution how to use um, funds they had not been used on other um, budget lines and to use that um, to, to fund the European Globalization Adjustment Fund. And that was quite a technical complex, but um, nevertheless, um, there was a political interest in finding a solution, and a solution was then found um, in that case. Okay, um, so let's see what, what else I have here. The unitary actor assumption. Um, looking at the political science theories about European integration, they all assume the Commission to be a unitary actor. And I think it does make sense if you look at the interinstitutional process, because that's simply the strongest negotiation process 
position the Commission can have. So it's better to act as a unitary actor in that point. Um, but our argument really is if you, if, you, if you take these theories, you cannot explain where a position of the Commission is made. Like in, a, in this policy space, you cannot understand um, why the, the proposal contains certain provisions and not others. And, and therefore you need to open the black box. And although there's a lot of case study and policy evidence about the struggles inside, there's no systematic explanation. And that's the way um, we try to walk with our book, to, to provide something more systematic on, on these questions. Um, where do ideological beliefs come from? That's very difficult to answer with um, the type of interviews we looked at, you would probably need to, to, to um, look more at, at the persons, like where they have been socialized, and that's more in the direction worked by Lisbeth Hoge or Hussein Kassim, who have worked on these issues. Um, what we do find, nevertheless, is that particularly on extreme proposals, it's very important. Um, and, and when a Green Commissioner um, says, I'm not going to fund nuclear um, research any longer, then that's an ideologically motivated um, position for us and if she says we just don't um, we are not going to have this type of research funding any longer or we use it or also um, some of the equal treatment directives um, they had part of the explanation is and um, the involvement of key actors inside the Commission in, in, in feminist movements so you have that as an ideological belief. Um, and some, in some cases, we could also very nicely control for the difference between party political interest and national interest. When a national government had changed in the meantime, um, and the commissioner was still from the old party, um, and was holding on to that position, although in the council the country was arguing against it, then this would be an ideological position for us. So that's a bit how we think about it. And we, it's not super important in quantitative terms, but it can explain some of the most extreme cases. And therefore, I think it's important, and maybe it's even becoming more important over time, because overall, we do have a politicization of the EU system. Uh, what else? I still have some time. Um, sorry? Um, yeah, let, let me, well, trialogues you mean the impact assessment or? No, uh, the question about the, the trialogues and to what an extent that has changed the system. That there's more and more trialogues, uh, decisions are made in trialogues rather than... Rather or like the system becoming more technocratic? Or was more, that more, more political? Yeah. But, uh, you know, to what an extent this has changed? Uh, I think it didn't know. fully understand the question. Could you maybe... Yeah, I didn't ask, but uh, basically we see now a, a movement towards decision taken in trialogue rather than through the norm of first and second reading. So first reading and a trialogue negotiation. A good decision. Precisely. And a good decision, yeah. Precisely. And to what an extent that has an impact on how the Commission... Uh, <coughs> I, based on my research, I cannot say anything about that um, because that's just not. I mean, we do find um, some similarities between both the lengths and also the topics raised inside the Commission and the interinstitutional process. Um, and we look at the what we call the shadow of the Council or the shadow of the EP on the earlier position formation, but we don't differentiate fine-grained enough between the different procedures um, in the interinstitutional process, I would say. Um, um, you had a question on the public procurement directives. Um, and actually what happened is that in the proposals we looked at, both from the late 1990s, the Commission proposals, um, it's like a bit of an experiment because you have a debate about both green and social criteria being allowed um, for awarding um, a public contract, but only the green criteria make it inside the Commission. So the question is, why is that? And we can trace that to um, 
a very active and very um, strategic and very um, with a lot of um, studies being conducted um, agency of um, DG Environment at the time who um, made a good case for including green um, criteria also because there were ECJ rulings at the time that particularly dealt with these questions why DG Employment just could not win the case on the basis of what they had as power of resources why in the public procurement directives that have been negotiated now and I think they are the ones that are currently implemented. You do have social criteria inside, and it would be very interesting to do like a follow-up story and to look at what change that the Commission proposal this time contained social criteria. But it did not in the late 1990s. Huh? Was that your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, Maybe I want you to follow up on yeah, that but, while you're yeah, sort of yeah, thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Just to follow up on that, because, I mean, apart from uh, what is in the uh, sort of uh, uh, procurement directives now, uh, you've, uh, you've got a lot of guides and uh, uh, issues on what the local people who award the contracts uh, can do on top of the directive or to interpret the directive. Uh, I put that sort of together with my uh, with my last question, which means if you were doing this exercise in ten years' time, what would you study as sort of uh, influence of the Commission, which is sort of less and less into binding legislation and more and more into sort of other soft policies? I don't know if you have an answer. Maybe yeah. not. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I I can't really answer on the basis of my research, but um, I would assume that the kind of conflicts we are looking at would still take place inside the Commission, not about um, what should be a certain provision in a directive, but what should be a recommendation, or how um, coordination among member states should be organized. So I would still assume that there are different positions inside, and that it's a question of power, which position can assert itself. Um, in these struggles inside. Um, I have, there's still this question about um, do we have, get ever more markets or do we get a social policy in its own right? Um, and it's, I would like to stress again that um, not we had three different policy areas. So our argument about this market steering category um, is not only based on the intersection of social um, and common market policy, but also um, contains a lot of insights from consumer policies. And there, for example, you had a lot of like this discussion, what kind of consumer image do we have in our directives? Is this the responsible consumer who can judge for him or herself, or do we need more protection for the consumer? Um, and this kind of question, um, I, I would assume that how they are decided um, very much will determine the kind of markets we get. We will get markets anyway. That's that's what we get out of this research. But it's really not an automatism the type of markets we get. Um, and also equal treatment policies, in a way, of course, those are individual rights and they are very important rights for workers, for example. Um, but it's also about a lot of access to markets, so it's not in, in, in a sense of classical social policy decommodifying um, individuals, but it's most of the even social policies at EU level are basically market policies in my view. Um, this can be contested of course, but um, so. <coughs> okay, I have certainly one question uh, about the organized interest because if I remember well in the chapter, uh, you were saying that uh, for the non-discrimination directive, the Commission used strategically the text from the NGOs to, to have the support from the NGOs. Uh, there is, if I'm not wrong, very little about the social partners and quite nothing about the trade unions, ETUC, and the only uh, mention you had was that the Commission decide for the equality between men and women directive, the, the consolidation, to have a recast directive because they don't want to mm -hmm. have the social partners. Uh, you don't say the trade unions or the employers, but the message from the 
the, the Commission seemed uh, rather clear because they are less progressive or they will not push uh, have a higher standard. So uh, my uh, question is from your interview, uh, what is the, the role or the assessment of uh, the trade unions uh, in, in the process? Because it's uh, rather strange that as an optional resource, the organized interests are rather low in the category uh, social and market. That's, they have by treaty access to normally to the Commission. Well, I can only speak for the cases we looked at. And um, within the classical, there is no classical labor law or industrial relation directive among these. Um, so I would assume that there would be more of an involvement of social partner on these issues. But in the area of development of anti-discrimination policies, what we saw was that the Commission quite intentionally um, moved towards um, NGOs, um, including these interests, because they would provide different access to different um, ideas, information, support from other stakeholders. Um, I would not say that in all those anti-discrimination directives they intentionally left out social partners, um, but they at least very strategically broadened their support base um, by looking at women lobbies and ILGA and age and all these concerns. Um, None of the directives we look at is one negotiated by the social partners. Um, so I guess there are two sides to my argument. It might be driven by case selection, that we don't see social partners, but at the same time during that pe period there were not a lot of other social policy acts negotiated. So the binding legislation we do have is not of the classical type involving social partners, like we know it from social partnership in, in, in some of the corporatist member states. So that's not what is going on at the intersection of social and common market policy at the EU level, in my view. I'm, <laughs> I don't know if you <laughs> might disagree. <laughs> but, um, and of course, I mean, if you look into the open method of coordination and all these other instruments, um, might be a very different picture, but from our cases, yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Yes. Two questions, so that's one question if someone has <coughs> want to have the last question. I've just, uh, I'm working for the, uh, in my last year of working for the EAS, I used to work for, for Relix, and uh, I'm involved in the uh, following from afar, the uh, TTIP uh, uh, discussion. And since your question is uh, which policy for Europe, highly uh, strong free market orientation, I think if you look at that, it encapsulates a lot at TTIP of what the future will bring. Uh, the economic crisis and basically the stagnation that we are feeling, the, de the uh, deterioration of the, of the, of the systemic uh, parameters in, in the free economy, or we'll call it capitalism. Uh, it's a test case. Also, there is this issue about uh, impact studies. Well, these are made in order to reinforce a pre-gone conclusion. And they are, if, if the result doesn't fit the DG, in this case trade, is being sent back to the to the people. After all, uh, the paymaster gets uh, what uh, what he's paying for. It's a refined. A former colleague did the, when I worked in development said uh, these consultants sees and and thing is a refined form of prostitution. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, so no, I, I think agree. there we encapsulate a lot of things and we see what things are to come. And mm -hmm. if the TTIP thing uh, is getting through, even elements of it. We can forget about all those, <laughs> all those regulations and, and things that other DGs are still uh, scratching their heads because it will be overwritten, undercut, and even the legal processes will be uh, neutralized of what we know as, 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 as an equitable process. Now, this may sound very uh, unsolidaric because I'm being paid by these people, but this is my observation. And, uh, and I mean, it's not polemic. I can give you many examples, yeah, how the stakeholder consultations are being misused, yeah, 
uh, used as, as just an alibi, providing, uh, you know, a, a, a good show. Uh, while uh, the course and, uh, and the objective is very clear, and that has to do with the political masters that sift through, uh, and the Barroso uh, Commission, and, and, and it, just, just listen what Oettinger says about uh, climate objectives and all that, uh, and what he said vis-a-vis -vis the American partners in these things. He said, over with this good boy stuff, it's nonsense. Uh, we're facing, you know what we face. Sorry, that's so cute. Okay, thank you. To, to, to put it a, more, a bit more general on the impact assessments, we systematically looked at the impact assessments and we did not find them to lead towards more balanced proposals or something. So uh, it, it goes a bit into the direction what you just mentioned, that the impact assessments often come relatively late in a process when positions are already formed and political battles are already exactly. running. Um, and in our 48 cases, we did not find them to um, to really serve the purpose <laughs> and that they they were put in the process. And that goes a bit into the direction of what I said about these, all these coordination mechanisms. They are there, but does not mean that they are necessarily leading to more balanced proposals. They can also be used as power resources by actors. So there's, again, no automatism to that. Okay, there is the last question. And yeah. <laughs> um, if you're questioning already impact assessment, my question is then: What about the public consultations? Because in yeah, <laughs> there already we sometimes see that public consultations are closed after decisions are already made. And what, how do you see that? Have you done any assessment of that? Thank you. Uh, yes, we looked at public consultation in all our cases. Um, it depends on the, uh, the model you're in. In a technocratic world, it can make a difference because it really broadens the information pool, so to say. In the others, they are just, it's a pick and choose. It's really a neo-pluralist world the Commission is acting in. And that's not my expertise of research, but there's very good research on these questions by people like Sandra Kröger or um, um, Beate Kola-Koch, we have looked at these things and overall starting with high expectation for public consultation and more or less all of them come to the conclusion that it's not to, uh, it's not what we hope them to be, so stop. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe one case, that's the exception that confirms the rule, but one case which you could sort of look at in a bit more detail I think where it has really influenced the process, or I mean, uh, influenced the, the the commissioner in his in his decision to push the uh, the idea is uh, in SME one, the uh, Social Market Act one. Um, I mean, the uh, the the uh, the abundance of uh, answers on sort of pushing the social entrepreneurship uh, agenda within the social market. Uh, was really sort of what decided the Commission to take it on board. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the last question uh, I can do some uh, at, but we will have a working paper on refit, and uh, part of the working paper is about impact in asse in, uh, assessment and uh, two policy briefs and a report on TTIP. So that's go to the website. <laughs> Thanks for the last intervention. I, I can put that in, in the debate. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed the presentation. I think that we can. Thanks again. again. Both Miriam and Agnes uh, for, for uh, the presentation and the discussion. Uh, the next uh, uh, monthly forum will be about the role of the parliament and the political role of the parliament with the two thesis. Uh, is that uh, do they vote right, left, uh, X thesis or, or not? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.